Welcome to WCAT TV radio. I'm Kiki Latimer and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And we have with us here today Father Nicholas Gregoris um, from New Jersey, correct, Father? Well, I live in New Jersey, but I'm not from New Jersey. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, but to begin with, Father has written a book called A Concise History of a hundred years of papal teaching on Catholic education. So I'm excited to be discussing a um, hundred years of Catholic education um, here today. Father, could you start us off with a prayer, please? Sure, of course. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and we shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his holy consolations through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So you were in New okay. Jersey, but uh, tell us how you got there. Where are you from originally? I'm originally from Manhattan, um, New York City, and um, I was born and raised there and went to Catholic schools there, and um, I eventually did go to college in New Jersey many, many moons ago, but um, I went to seminary in Rome, and that's why I studied for my doctorate in sacred theology, and then later, um, in the past couple of years, I received a second doctorate in Catholic education at Pontifex University, and that's how this book came about as a doctoral dissertation defense. You, you mentioned right at the very beginning of the book that Catholic schools are the heart of the church. Yes. Is I can speak from personal experience that I would, you know, I don't think I would be the man, let alone the priest that I am today, if it were not for the Catholic school, Catholic education I received from elementary school all the way up through graduate school. Um, I was taught by very good uh, sisters, the Apostle of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and by and uh, the Scalabrian Fathers, both Italian orders, and uh, they really instilled in me a, a deep love of the Catholic faith and love of the sacred liturgy, the priesthood, um, all the aspects of Catholicism permeating, you know, uh, daily life. And um, my pilgrimage has began with Catholic schools, in a sense, and it's culminating uh, after I'm now 20, almost 27 years, 28 years priest, and I'm uh, I'm, I've been in Catholic education in one way or the other since childhood and then as a teacher. And I think that, you know, it's, it's basically, um, it's the foundation of my humanity, not just my Christianity, my Catholicism. And I think that's what's meant that it's the heart of the church in the sense that um, that's what young minds are formed, young hearts, young souls are formed in the Catholic school, and that they are prepared to become good citizens in this world, but also always with the sense, the idea that they belong to the city of God, to the heavenly kingdom. And so they, they're, they're, the Catholic perspective is we're passing through this world, but we're here to sanctify the world and better the world and prepare it for the coming of Christ. And um, so that's, I think that's what, in part, what means it's the heart of the church, it's the heart of everything that the church stands for and aims to do um, is to sanctify and save people, you know, and that begins right. with the teaching, educating the scriptures, um, divine revelation, you know? That's beautiful. I mean, I'm a convert to Catholicism, so I did not go to Catholic right. school. Um, but I did go to mm -hmm. a Catholic nursery school. Um, and I had, I still have sweet when I was four, I, I guess, in, in Connecticut. And I still have very sweet memories of the nuns. Um, and my father was supposed to pick me up on my way home, on his way home from work, and occasionally he would forget me, <laughs> and uh, which was wonderful. Uh -huh. And I got to have um, they must have been wonderful Italian nuns because I remember their spaghetti and meatballs. Mm -hmm. I, the sisters who taught me actually they're Italian, but their mother house is in Connecticut, at Hamden, Connecticut. Oh. Um, they were the sisters who taught me in elementary school. They were an Italian foundation, an Italian order, but that's where the American beachhead is in Connecticut. So we have that in common. Uh, um, at the time, I really didn't know that, but later I, I understood that they were. That's where their mother house was. Yeah, we were in Stamp, I believe, Stamford, Connecticut, at the time. So okay. I've never, I've okay. never looked them up, but maybe one of these days I will. Sure, sure. 
Well, you can always have the spaghetti and meatballs. That's always good. <laughs> so somehow they must have prayed for me because, um, you know, it was some years later, but, um, you know, I made my way to Catholicism, made my way home to Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also, mm -hmm. through, um, you know, I ha happened to stumble into Catholic education at a secular university so that had a mm -hmm. Catholic philosophy department. So that's another long story, but... Um, oh, that's good. Yeah, but I'm very... Well, God has mysterious ways. He's got multiple ways of grabbing us and, you know, leading us along as long as we cooperate with His grace, you know. So whether we're cradle Catholics like myself or converts like you, you know, it's the same, it's God, it's the same God and His grace is being, you know, showered on us in different ways, you know, in different circumstances. But it's Absolutely. to lead us all to Himself. So you st you you've gone back, given us a hundred years here in your book. So you go back to Pope Benedict the Fifteenth, um, who was Pope from nineteen fifteen right. to nineteen twenty two. Correct. Yeah, we had to choose. We had to stop with Benedict the Fifteenth because we, could, if you kept on pushing back, you know, the book would be unwieldy. So we we we, we chose a hundred years and a centenary of papal teaching on Catholic education just because it was a logical place to start. And we ended, of course, with Francis, uh, the current Pope. So, but, the, you know, there's a lot of material. The the, the bulk of the material has uh, to do with, you know, basically papal writings and addresses, talks, and things like that. Um, and then you also documents of this, the Holy See. You mentioned his, his encouraging of the education of girls at that point in time. Yes. Yeah, that right. That was, um, yeah, of course, you know, um, it given the situation at the time, you know, maybe the focus was more on the education of young boys, and here Benedict XV is, is um, impressing on the mothers and t sisters the importance of teaching young girls to prepare them for, the, for the life's ch challenges for motherhood, for you know, they, the things that they could do at that time. The, they were more limited in that time, but now, you know, in hindsight, we can see that the popes had in, uh, an interesting insight into even human psychology to say, you know, this is in, it's important to educate uh, young women so that they can Im imitate the saints, the lives, the virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and become mothers, good, you know, good sisters, good wives, etc. Mm -hmm. well, and also yeah. become school teachers themselves. Right, right. Well, we talk about parents being, you know, the primary and, you know, and beginning educators of children. Um, but, you know, recent, um, recent, what do you call it, surveys and things like that, um, re re research, sorry, <laughs> show us that for the early years, it's primarily the mother. And then for older children, it's primarily the father, um, the teaching. Mm -hmm. Of virtue and morals, so it's really important those those early years. Mom is the one that's with the little ones. Dad's generally working. Right. Um, so the importance. Yeah, of my mom. My mom taught me. Yeah. Yeah. Mommy, before I was ever in a school, my mother was teaching me how to read and write. Um, my father would teach me how to play sports, you know, and do other things, how to dress, how to edit some etiquette and things like that. But my mother was my primary teacher in the basics, you know, of um, reading, writing, and arithmetic. So I, that's what I remember even before going to school. And then later, in fact, my dad would have more of an influence on me as I grew as a young man and as I contemplated becoming a priest and so forth. So that seems to fit even in my own experience. And I grew up in the 80s. So, you know, um, I, I think I it's mean, complimentary. Like, Men and women are complimentary, you know, fathers and mothers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I do remember my mother was a fallen away Catholic. Um, and but I do remember her teaching me, you know, when I was very little. I remember her teaching me the Our Father, um, and mm -hmm. bedtime prayers, you know, so there was mm -hmm. um there was some foundation there that, you know, the groundwork was being laid, which was important. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, neither of my parents actually were practicing Catholics. My dad is a convert from the Greek Orthodox Church, and that didn't happen until I was in my teen years. And my mother was basically a fallen away, non-practicing Catholic, really didn't have much background in either in the faith. And so neither of my parents, when I was young, 
had anything much to do with the church. Um, so it was a miracle that they sent me to Catholic. My father um, and my mom, unfortunately, separated when I was very young. My dad did decide to send us to Catholic school, and it was through the school that I started to, um, you know, serve Mass and, and consider discern a priestly vocation. But all along, my dad was not a practicing Catholic, and eventually, I think, by the grace of God, he saw what it was doing in my life, and then I would, you know, pass on literature to him and the Bible and lives of the saints and things like that. And eventually he decided to become Roman Catholic and made a profession of faith as a Greek Orthodox do. So God uses, God used me in a, in a, in a sense through my elementary school years to bring him into the faith. Unfortunately, my mother, um, wasn't around, so she never had that, you know, I didn't have that, um, relationship with her. So, it's like that expression, what is it, the boy is father to the man. That's interesting. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. The next pope you mentioned um, is I, Pius XI. Yes. And, and he talks a lot about the rights of Catholic parents and really trying to safeguard Catholic education against the secular mm -hmm. forces. Right. It was a very difficult time in, in Italy, in Europe. You know, you had the rise of National Socialism and communism, and this type of fascism that was coming down heavy on the church was happening also in Mexico and Spain. There was a civil war, you know, the Cristeros War, and the, the, those martyrs were shouting, you know, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, in defense of their, their freedom as to, to believe, as be Catholic. And so in Italy, there was also, you know, the not so much war at that time, but there was um, a lot of turmoil, you know, trying to secularize society and throw the church to the to the corner, you know, and um, Pius the Eleventh was fighting against that. He was trying to say, you know, education has to be safeguarded. It has to be, first and foremost, um, a, the role of the parents to teach, not the state. The church comes second. The first comes the parents, then the church, then the state last. They, in his time, they want to put the state first, and we see this happening even in our own time, you know, where the state wants to take over the lives of children and just indoctrinate them however they want to and put the parents last. And so Pius the Pius the Eleventh was saying, no, this this can't be, this doesn't work. He was saying this in the 1920s, you know, so, and early 30s. And um, he was defending... Right? I'm sorry? You wrote Casti Kanubi, right, on marriage, family. Casti Kanubi, yes, on marriage, on uh, against artificial contraception, and um, obviously in favor of the traditional Catholic theology of marriage, family, and the sanctity of human life. So long before there was any, you know, Humani Vitae, we had Casti Kanubi, which was preparing the way for Humani Vitae under Paul VI. And, thank, you know, thankfully, Pius XI saw the, the, these moral issues as important, and um, he, he sort of had the seminal work done before, you know, d decades later, there would be Paul VI and John Paul II and Benedict and so forth to, to build on that foundation. It always amazes me. I was reading Arcanum, which is Pope Leo, back in 1890-something. And, and he, in yeah, that, he talks 13. about, yeah, and he talks about, you know, what would happen if divorce was allowed and, and how badly it right. would primarily hurt women and children. And, you know, I was reading that and I thought, oh, this must be a recent document. And then I looked and, you know, mm -hmm. it's in the 1890s. Um, right. Guys are amazing. And divorce, you know, it's true. It's very prescient, very um, uh, sort of inspired that they were able to see, the posts were able to see the consequences. You know, they didn't have a crystal ball, so to speak, but uh, they understood how things were related, and and they could see the ramifications of bad actions of immoral, immoral, immoral life of people in individuals, and how that would impact society and the church. You yeah, know, how even snowball. Pope Pius the Twelfth. I'm sorry, the snowball yeah, effect, how, exactly. How the snowball snowball effect. Yeah, or slippery slope. I mean, slippery you know, slope, the, exactly. Yeah, when mm -hmm. you know. I mean, the moral relativism. Yeah. Go ahead, moral, moral relativism, relativism is, is a slippery slope. You know, once you you get rid of one objective truth, you can get rid of the next one just as easily. And uh, the whole, you know, the stack of cards falls down. You know, you're building on a house of, on, on sand rather than on rock. 
and the, and the world doesn't want to hear that. The world wants shift, everything to shift and change all the time. You know, modernism, uh, also, you know, let's change doctrine to, to suit the sensibilities of the time, and then you end up destroying doctrine, you know? And the same thing happens with morality. You know, once you make it relative, then it has no foundation. You, you can't propose anything to the next generation. The next generation is lost and um, confused, you know? And we see that now, a lot of young people without religion, without faith, no moral guidance, they don't understand that there are normal, there are moral norms that are objective, there are, there's objective truth, that truth doesn't change with your feelings, your emotions. Right. The same thing, you know, with gender ideology, making up your own identity from day to day, um, it's, it's really, it's, I think it's a diabolical reality we're dealing with, you know, just, you know, unmooring ourselves, separating ourselves from truth, from, and in order to just be relativistic about everything. If you don't, yeah. like you mentioned, they, they saw these popes that are, are writing uh, the encyclicals, they see the connections between things. Um, and when we don't see the connections, you know, an, an, an isolated idea can look very good all by itself. You know, if you don't understand its connections to the rest of the spider web, um, you can see how, how important it is not to be in error. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, a uh, little bit of poison, you know, so if I give you a salad and I say, this salad is wonderful, has the best organic greens imaginable, the best tomatoes from New Jersey, and et cetera, et cetera, but there's, I put a little bit of poison in it, it's not right. worth eating. Mm -hmm. You're going to die, potentially. Mm -hmm. You're going to harm yourself. So, you know, just because tr when truth is mixed with errors, that's, ju that's just as bad as just having an error by itself often. Because people can see some of the truth and they say, oh, that looks really, those things look really nice. But meanwhile, the, the, the apple is rotten on the inside. The salad has been poisoned. And so you got to be very careful because truth mixed in with lies is the devil's work. That's how he plays. He doesn't just put before us, you know, evil for its own sake. He always puts before us something that looks good, appears good. And that how, and young people especially are susceptible to this. They're susceptible to not, you know, young people in particular because they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the background, mm -hmm. um, and there's peer pressure and other things that make them, you know, social media, other other influences that are telling them, just you know, live your life the way you feel like it. Don't worry about consequences. Right. The next pope you mentioned is Venerable Pope Pius the Twelfth, and of course, this guy was coming in right in the middle of towards the end here in the middle of World War II. Um, so there was a lot going on during this papacy. Yes, um, yes this was a, a, a very, very difficult time to be anyone alive, let alone Pope. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he, he got sandwiched in between Nazism and, and communism and ha had to steer the ship. The church was... In Italy, especially, was going becoming more and more secular. Europe was secularizing fat, much faster than anything ever happened in the United States, really. And this is long before computers and inter, you know social media or anything like that. Um, the churches were not as full. People were falling away after World War II. Um, you know, they felt you know this was a time to now just sort of indulge and you know rebuild and indulge, enjoy life, and sort of pushing God to the to the to the outskirts to the side. And um, Pius XII was trying to hold onto the church in the middle of the road and, and really did a wonderful job to teach all, all different groups of people in this tumultuous time um, and was you know, protecting the Jews and doing all kinds of things um, as war was, you know, was ravaging Europe. And his own, he was, you know, Hitler had threatened even to have him um, kidnapped. It never happened, but you know the, the Germans, the Nazis came in and took over Rome, and so it was a very, very difficult time. They bombed Rome, and Pius the Twelfth went out to console the people after the bombing, and it's a you know, very, very emotionally tense time, a difficult time. You can see why he wrote a lot about the misuse of technology. You know that it's going to yes, be a great gift, but you know he, yeah, you know saw the bombings of. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So he saw what we could do with technology um, used for 
ill. <laughs> um, yeah. And and and, and he saw what happened. Was, you know, he, mm -hmm. he saw the good part, the good to it too. But obviously, it has to be used by the right people. You know, if you you have good people using good technology, you know, good will come out. But if you have people with bad intentions, they're going to misuse the technology for. Um, you know, nefarious purposes, then you're in trouble because they're going to, you know, pervert knowledge, pervert people's uh, viewpoints. And, you see, and that's happening even now as we speak. You know, there's good right. use of technology and bad, bad use of it. Unfortunately, a lot of the, a lot of young people, I think even parents discover this during COVID, you know, um, there's a lot of bad use of technology. Kids are not being instructed and in, in they had too much access to it or they're freely using it. And there's the dark web and all kinds of bad stuff out there. But if you can have some constraints on that, you know, then and teach kids how to use things properly, and then that 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 will be that's important. Um, I think it's also interesting that Pius the twelfth, Pius the twelfth, you know, in one of his talks, he says, you know, it's not enough for you Catholic school teachers to display crucifixes and sacred images in your classrooms to catechize children. You really need to explain these things to them. It's not enough to hang something on the wall, but you have to be able to explain the, say, the significance of what you're seeing, or for that matter, what you're reading, you know? Not just to go through the motions, or not just to have some superficial approach to religion, but it should be um, more deeply rooted. You know, I think that's interesting. I mean, there has to be understanding, you know? Um... Right. You know, right. You have to be able to grab onto something that, you know, my my ten year. I have thirteen grandchildren, but my ten year old. Oh, wow. <laughs> my ten year old. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, he's been the the whole family's been watching the chosen, and um, mm. but Oliver's been particularly touched by it, um, and and is feeling like he's learning more than he learned, you know, has learned before, and he has just been, you know. A, a wanting a deeper and deeper understanding of his Catholicism. He's just turning 10 this coming week. Um, so it's been, it's been very exciting to see his faith grow because he's being taught more. Um, he's, he's really falling in love with it. We're <laughs> been praying for <laughs> well, kids are like sponges, you know, <laughs> um, the younger, the better to, to the, the more, they, they learn at a younger age, the more hopefully they retain and they have more to, you know, knowledge is power as it were, you know. Right. Um, and it's also, as long as they're living, you know, uh, they have socialization and they enjoy, you know, the outdoors and they enjoy be, being with others, you know, um, studying is a good thing, you know, not, not to make it burdensome, but you, as you said, you know, you can reinforce what, what he's learning at a young age through other means. And that's right. one of the good the good things with technology and um, um, good entertainment, you know, the good right. films that can reinforce our beliefs and give us a deeper sense of the scriptures and so forth. Right. Pope Pius the I have only seen episodes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, you mentioned the chosen. I've only seen I've seen many episodes, but I I've I've heard mixed reviews. I have my own views on it. You know, there are there is some debate over. The chosen um, in certain circles, but we don't have to get into that. That's not the purpose yeah. of our. Overall, I mean, there's our, um, a few yeah. issues here and there, but overall, I think it's. I personally think it's mm -hmm. it's been beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things he mentioned, um, Pope Pius the Twelfth, was the importance of parents praying with their children. Right. Absolutely. You know, I remember when I was a kid kids coming to school by themselves, coming to mass on Sunday by themselves, you know, I'm like, and I was doing the same thing. My parents, you know, my father, and my, my parents weren't there either, but you know, you send a kid to school and say, okay, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to watch the football game. You know, I'm going to just sleep a couple extra hours. That's not, that's not the kind of example that the kids need. The kids need for parents to be with them to pray with them, to teach them how to pray, and not only to pray on Sunday at, at Mass, which is the, you know, the center of our faith, but at home, you know, prayer before meals, uh, praying the rosary. If you can't pray the full rosary, to pray a decade of the rosary. Prayer, prayer before going to bed at night, you know, to, the guardian, to your guardian angel, looking at a crucifix, kissing an image of, a, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph. You know, just 
something, these little things kids remember. These things are the things that really reform minds, even maybe more than the classroom instruction. It's how parents interrelate, relate with their children and what they teach them and how they relate to them um, in terms of virtue, in terms of kindness, compassion, but also how they emulate the, the virtues of the faith and the teachings of the, and, and reinforce the teachings of the faith. Um, right. That's so, so important, blessed. you know. Yeah, so important. Because what a teacher says in the classroom needs to be backed up. It needs to be consolidated, corroborated by the parents at home. If it's not, it's going to fall short. It's not going to have its full impact on the ch on the child. It's, that's right. critical. Um, it's no matter, you know, you can't expect like the sisters or the brothers or the priests or just the lay teachers in the Catholic school to have a magic wand and, oh, my kids are fine, you know, they're, they're with them all day long, I can just sort of do other things. You know, you have to really follow up on that, you know, and reinforce them. Mm -hmm. The, the Pope after him yeah. was St. John Paul the twenty third from 1958 to 1963. And uh, um, I noticed St. John the 23rd. That's, yeah. Yeah. John the 23rd. John and I noticed 23rd. you mentioned mm -hmm. the principle of gradualism in moral theology. Yes. yes. Um, I, I mean, I think it's a very important yeah. principle, you know, because as, as a priest, I hear confessions and so I and do spiritual direction. So when I have someone come to me who says, Father, I have had this bad habit for so many years, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it would be easy for me to say, well, you know, just go cold turkey and stop. Not everything can be done that way in life. Sometimes you can do things cold turkey. Sometimes things need to be gradually uh, changed. And God understands that not everyone's capable of just stopping everything all at once. So I have had to, you know, give instructions to people and say, listen, okay, let's take it step by step and, and work toward a full purification if you fall between now and then, you know, pick yourself up, come back to confession, come back to spiritual direction, and let's start, you know, let's start again. Don't get, don't fall into a depression. Don't give up on God. He won't give up on you. He doesn't expect always that every person would just sort of make that full transition to virtue overnight. I think that's the principle of gradualism. Um, and it has worked, for, has worked in my experience as a priest helping people. Um, sometimes, though, you know, the, vir the vice may be so bad that you need to, as St. Thomas says, run to virtue. The, if the vice is that bad that it's destroying your life, then you, you know, there's no gate. You can't, there's maybe no middle road there. You, may, you have to just run to the opposite extreme. But other times you can make that gradual transition. And God, mm -hmm. God will give you the grace if you ask for it. Yeah. And, it really is and also, um, John. Mm-hmm. Just a sense of, of using kindness with people rather than harshness as much as we possibly can. Yeah, right. I mean, as, as, as long as a genuine, as Christ was genuinely kind and compassionate and merciful, you know, did he get angry? Did Yes, when he saw hypocrisy, when he saw obstinacy. But when you're dealing with average people who are actually making the best, if they're making the best effort and they're falling, you know, and they're and they're not comprehending. His own disciples didn't comprehend. And he got frustrated with them, but he didn't turn them away. Um, you know, he didn't. He, it, the, you know, when you have a child who's disobeying you, dis, disrespecting you, you have to be firm. You have to be just and merciful, but you don't have to turn them away. You don't have to push them away. You're supposed to, like the good shepherd, brings the sheep back to the fold. He doesn't ostracize the sheep. The only time you get ostracized is when you're, you're obstinate and you want nothing really to do with the other sheep. You're saying, I want to be by myself. I don't want any connection with anyone else. You're sort of self-isolating in that point. But I think teachers, parents, priests, bishops, we need to, you know, hook people in as much as possible. And uh, that, that's the best way to do is the kindness. But sometimes you do have to, you know, lay down the rules. You know, there are parameters. You know, you have to also discipline, because if you don't discipline a child, you spoil the child, the Bible says, right? Right. Um, the child, uh, I, same thing in the classroom, I was once told when I was a very young priest, a young teacher, um, don't smile until Christmas. <laughs> because the idea, you know, the idea being that if you show them too much of 
you know, jolliness, kindness right away, they get to think you're easy and a pushover. Mm-hmm. And kids in high school, especially sophomores, you know, so, oh yeah, fathers, he's, he's, a, he's easy. We can get over on him. We can get whatever we want from him, you know, and right. rather you need to set some rules and parameters first. And then, the, then you could show them more leniency as you, as you gain their respect. You know, I think parents have to gain the respect of their, their student, their, their kids. They don't want to be buddies with their kids. If your buddy system doesn't work. Right. I'm not used to say it because I'm not your, I'm your mother. I'm not your friend. I can be your friend right. when you're older. You know? Later. Right. Yeah. I mean, friendship is, yeah. Friendship could be like between us, but between adults, but you're, you're not primarily, you have to be the, the parent, the mother, the father first. Right. Um, and that's, and that's, there has to be that respect because if that respect's lost then the child will just get, go off on a tangent and, you know, and, if you give everything, you know, if the kid is asking, playing mommy off of daddy and daddy off of mommy, that's not good. It can be cute, but it also can be detrimental right. because if they, you know, the mother, the mother, the mother is say the mother is the one giving the child everything he or she wants and the father is the disciplinarian or vice versa. And, you know, God willing, it balances out, but it's not actually a good thing. You know, both parents should have a little bit of the, of the sweetness and a little bit of the, you know, the starkness in, it, in them. <laughs> Taking turns playing good cop, bad cop. I used to say. Right. So, and that, it's just reality. <laughs> yeah. It's just reality. I meant to mention the, the Pope before the one we're discussing now talked about um, the importance of the formation of the conscience. You know, we have this idea, you know, follow mm-hmm. your conscience. And yes, you do have to follow mm-hmm. your conscience. Um, even when your conscience is in error, we have to follow it. Um, but we don't want our conscience to be in error. And I think a lot That's of people right. think that the conscience is like a little magical orb inside mm-hmm. our brains that knows right from wrong. And of course, I mean, we have some of the natural law in our hearts, but much of our conscience needs to be formed. That's correct. Yeah, formation of conscience is very important, you know. Um, that's critical for every Catholic, every Christian, every human being. You know, as you said, it's not an automatic. Uh, yes, we do have the natural light of reason. We have natural law inscribed in our hearts. St. Paul teaches us that, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Augustine, for that matter. Um, but it's not an automatic. It, it does need to be formed. You have to have an informed conscience first. You have to have truth, truth and charity. Um, if you have truth, will inform, will 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 be able to enlighten your content. You need to enlighten it with truth. And then the practice of virtue, the actual putting into practice of your faith, and, and not just talking about matters of faith, but living those matters out in your life, that will form your conscience. So you know then, when you make a decision, you're doing it as a Catholic Christian. You're doing it with the light of reason and the light of faith. And uh, the formation is very important, and that should happen from a very young age. You know, um, when we talk about keeping the commandments, for example, what does that mean in practical terms? You know, it's not just laws external to us. We want to internalize the meaning of those commandments, and that will help them form our person, our conscience, our way of life, and how then we deal with other people. Right. It's very difficult with a society, you know, with materialism and relativism, you know, it was very common, right. I think, in the 60s and 70s to, you know, say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to bring my child to church. I'm going to let them figure it out for themselves. And I'm not going to discipline them because they, they need to figure mm-hmm. out for themselves what's right and what's wrong. Um, mm-hmm. So we have this. Well, that this hippie mentality. That was a hippie mentality. <laughs> right. And so we yeah. have. That didn't work hearts. out too well. That didn't work out too well. Um, and mm-hmm. a lot of, and a lot of people don't realize that the amount of unhappiness that comes when your life is in error. It's not just that, well, it mm-hmm. doesn't work out. It, it works out really badly. Um, right. You know, our, you know, God wants us to be happy. <laughs> the rules are That's right. He wants us to be happy. That's yeah. right. They're meant for our good, for our welfare. As you said, for our happiness, not only here, but in the life to come. But, but the happiness of eternity has to begin here. If we're miserable creatures here, we're not really saints. Saints are joyful. Saints are mm-hmm. cheerful. Saints, not in a, in a superficial sense, but in a profound sense, because you realize God loves you. 
God desires your 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 happiness, your health, your 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 salvation, and He never abandons you. He never forsakes you. And even if you have suffering, you can those crosses united to Christ, you can bear them with joy, as you read in the lives of the saints. But when you have no faith perspective, if everything is materialism, if everything becomes consumerism or secularism, then um, you're at a loss. You have no means. You have nothing to fall back on. There's nothing to look forward to. If everything is about this life and there's nothing in the life to come, well, you have nothing to, to no higher standard than yourself or the sinful people around you. And that's a real bad, that's a black hole, you know? Right. That's a vortex. Um, the Catholic miserable. faith, I think, yeah, it's misery. Miser hell, hell is ultimately a, a type of, it's, it's misery because you're, you have separated yourself and from what makes you happy. And ultimately, it's God who, who created you who makes you happy. You know, St. Augustine says, Oh Lord, thou hast created us for thyself, and our hearts are restless, restless until they rest in thee. So we're really, our greatest, our fulfillment as human beings is in relationship to God. And he gives us the commandments because he knows we're weak, fallen human beings. We have original sin, the consequences of original sin. So we need those commandments. We need to know right from wrong. But it's not to burden us. It's to liberate us, to free us to, to live a happier life, which is the life of holiness, the life of grace. Um, you know, I remember Benedict XVI said, you know, uh, uh, he, and he cited John Paul II, he said, throw open the, you, the doors of your hearts to Christ. Christ takes nothing from you. He gives everything to you. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. to let Christ into you, your hearts, because Christ is not there to, to take away your humanity. He's there to, to, to sanctify and to fulfill your humanity, to make it even greater, mm -hmm. to expand your humanity. And I think that's the beauty of Catholicism. It's meant to expand you, not to diminish you. While the world the flesh, the devil, diminishes you and makes you unhappy. It's funny, you know, when you just hear people, young people hear the concept of rules, they immediately think, oh, I'm going to be constricted mm -hmm. from doing something good. And uh, I teach a mm -hmm. philosophy class here at the house with a couple of my grand older grandchildren, the 16 and 17-year-old, and their friend. And mm -hmm. I... I, the 17 year old had just gotten his license and it was very exciting. And I said to him, how would you like to, you know, he's driving on the main highway now on 95. And I said, how would you like to drive on the mm -hmm. highway? With no rules. And he said, you know, well, what do you mean? I said, just no rules. And anyway, everyone can do whatever they want on the highway. You can go mm -hmm. whatever speed you want. You can drive on whichever side of the road you want. You can do whatever you want. Right. There's no rules. And he said, I'd be killed, you know, like within the first right. hour. Exactly. 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 I mean, it's like, you know, it's the same thing, you know, like playing. I love sports and I play all different types of sports. But what, how can you play a sport without rules? It's competition. You're playing, you know, it's like you can't play basketball, football, baseball, or soccer without rules. You have to have rules. We seem to be, we seem to be willing to accept rules for everything except for religion. Because religion goes to the heart of who we are as a person. And how we are to how we are to act ethically morally you know right. and it requires sacrifice you know we're it seems like you know athletes are willing to sacrifice to play their sports but then are we willing to to train ourselves and for spiritual warfare are we willing to train ourselves to become saints which is you know um, i think it's more difficult than training your body training your soul your spirit yeah. And and rules are necessary. Whether you mean to to run a computer, to use the phone, we're on a Zoom call. You know, you, there are rules. There's rules. There are rules for everything. You know, even just. Mm -hmm. But we we just don't want to. I think that we were rebelling at some level. That's you know, I will do my own thing, and it, you know, I will not. I want to serve myself. I don't want to serve a higher being, and that that leads to all kinds of problems. Yeah, it, it was interesting. A few years ago, the um, the Connecticut, uh, the UConn girls basketball team was mm -hmm. uh, was winning. I think they won over 100 games straight. It was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that was pointed out to me was two things. One, they followed the rules. And two, they didn't care who got the shot. You know, they so right. they played as a team and it was just amazing to watch right. that and they had skill obviously yeah. but the and combination you come, you come basketball mm -hmm. 
it was it was beautiful to watch because they right. took care of one another so that the you could tell the the rules of the game were there but also uh, social morality was also there between them mm -hmm. it's so a, that, you know uh, I, the Utah bas the men's basketball team this year also you know repeated uh, the same mentality i think it's you know it's uh, you you put you sacrifice you you you're playing a team sport you're following the rules you're you're sacrificing for your teammates you're giving the ball when you open guy you know though if we could translate some of that to our kids and say listen that that mentality is works not only in sports but that's something how you live in society it's not that you're living in isolation and in rugged individualism you're living with other human beings you need to learn how to relate to them in an ethical way, do unto others the golden rule. If you do that, your team's going to win. Society will be better. Instead of just looking out for me, 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 you know, right. the me generation. Um, the idea, that's a good analogy because you want to win championships the way UConn does regularly, then you have to be, you know, hard work, sacrifice, and play with love of the game and with always understanding you have teammates there. You're not playing one-on-one -on -one isolation. Right. Love of one you know, another. If, yeah. yeah, exactly. If I only took the basketball and and every time I touched the basketball, I I shot the basket, the basketball, and I just was a uh, you know basically a ball hawk shooting the basketball. That's not Fine. that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work in life, and doesn't work in the family. It doesn't work in school. It doesn't work in in a job even. You know, and it doesn't work in religion. Right. You know, that's one thing that I think yeah. makes us different. Protestant Protestants are different than Catholics. You know, this we are more of a sense of of the of the community. Mm. While in Protestantism, I think it tends to come down to me and Jesus, me and the yeah. Bible. I consider it home and just basically pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, kind of thing. Yeah, it, that's not that's not the Catholic way. It's never been oh. the Catholic way for two thousand years. There, you have your relation, your individual relationship with Christ, but it's always rooted in the church. You know, the church is your mother. She's your teacher. Like John the 23rd said, Mata et Magistra, mother and teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's very important that, you know, we, we're not just believing in isolation. We're not living in isolation. We're living in community, in communion with God and one another. Yep. So moving on to Pope Paul VI from 1963 to 1978, I noticed that he was one of the first, it seems, to use the radio for a message to school children in the United States. So that was mm -hmm. uh, sort of a precursor, pre runner yeah. to World Youth Day. Um, <laughs> right. Talking out to the he children. He, that he, was new. Yeah, and he, he, he had, a, a, you know, he, Paul VI was a very bright man. He was shy, you know, very, he's had a noble character. He carried himself in a very noble way. But um, people would say he's cold, but, uh, you know, you could be shy, you could be, you know, somewhat reserved. But he, he was able to teach. He taught very well, and he was able to teach without using too many words. He was able to write beautiful encyclicals and other writings with um, without verbosity. And with the kids here in this, this, this one discourse, he tells them, you know, it's during, it's Lent, you're praying, you're fasting, you're giving alms. Um, don't let that be just for yourself. Think of the poor, think of the hungry, think of those who have those things you don't have, the homeless and the orphaned. Unite your sacrifices to their sufferings and pray for them. And, and, and it's very, it's very interesting. You know, that's a very, that's something a school teacher should say, you know, and here the Pope is saying that, you know. Beautiful. And he's saying, make, add your little, your little sacrifices to bring aid and comfort to those in distress, to help your bishops to aid those those poor children in the world of the world. So there was a sense in that time. I think children would make collect. There would be collections. The sisters would make collections for the poor, the needy in the classroom, and then that money would be sent to charity, the missions. You know, I think that's important. You know, the, the fact that we are a missionary church. This is a, a missionary. We have to have missionary zeal and attend to the needs of others who are not in the fold and to others who are less fortunate than we are. And uh, Paul VI makes that point in their radio message. After him, we have the very short papacy of John Paul I. Um, yes. Which is the first pope I remember because I had just gotten married mm -hmm. in Utica. Again, I was not Catholic yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember, of course, not so much hearing about when he was elected pope, but hearing that he died a month later, 33 days right, later. 33 days. 
That right. made the news, um, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I remember being aware of that and thinking, well, that's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. But he did not in those he had a right. Yeah, he was a very good, you know, catechetical teacher as a bishop, as a priest. Um, he was involved in catechetical work. So I think those catechetical lessons, then he was able, when he was elected pope, and 1978, although he didn't have many audiences, I think he had three audiences, a month of work, a month worth of audiences. In those audiences, he focused on the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and he explained to the um, the people there, including children, the importance of, of 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 those virtues and how to, and also the understanding of the the, the four um, cardinal virtues. But his focus was on the three logical virtues, and um, so short time. But he was able to pack a lot into that little that month of his. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, John Paul II was elected on, you know, in that that fall after he died, and that's in October my... <laughs> of 1978. <laughs> so that's that the was Pope the... of our generation, so to speak. Yeah, and that's the Pope, of course, that I came into the church under. Um... I think it's just a great what well he's clearly John Paul the Great. I mean <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, I mean he was a he was a, a, a giant of a pope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. once in a, a once in a lifetime, once in maybe a thousand years or so do you come up with someone who has you know, he reigned let's see, he reigned almost twenty seven years and he went, you know, he, he touched upon everything imaginable. Um he traveled more than any other pope. He, they say he, his he, face is the most well, the most seen face of any face that's ever lived. Oh, sure. I mean, he 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 had the largest, you know, gatherings of human beings. Uh, I think it was in the Philippines, the largest gathering of human beings in recorded history. Um, he was able to touch countless lives. Um, even in Rome alone, he visited all the many many of the churches. You know, there are hundreds of churches in Rome. Um, I don't know if he got to see all of them, but he got to see many of them, and he was able to also visit. You, every time I go to Italy, uh, and you go around and you see plaques commemorating his visits, you know, it, it, it's amazing how much yeah. he was able to accomplish. And he had a great deal of suffering in his in his youth, and his as a as a young as a seminarian, he had to study study underground. He grew up between the, with the Nazis and the communists, and. Um, he was able then to become a great teacher and a mentor to young people, and he was multi-talented. I mean, how often do you find someone who can be, you know, a playwright, a philosopher, a theologian, an athlete, all wrapped up into one with I mean, a great sense really of humor, like, linguistic he ability? He listed his attributes and... and yes, I mean, I don't really do justice, I don't think. But, you know. <laughs> it's really like this model of almost perfection in a human being. It's really amazing. Um, I mean, if, if we had, you know, if we had an eighth or a quarter of those attributes, you know, I mean, if our leaders had that, those attributes, we would be in much better shape than we are now. I mean, not that you have to have the same personality. Obviously, no one has the same personality. But mm -hmm. in terms of just those, a bit, those skills, the charisms, um, the leadership ability, the humanitas, you know, the humanity of John Paul II. He was a, he was a wonderful human being. It's just an you know, long before he was elected. Yeah, I mean, he had an expansive heart, an expansive soul. He was always seeking to touch as many people as possible and help, um, and really saw himself as the father of the church. You know, as as the as the um, as we are his children, wherever we were in the world, he would try to learn the language of the of uh, a little bit to be able to speak to the groups that he was meeting with on a regular basis. And when he traveled, I mean, learn their culture, learn their language. Um, it's quite quite something, you know. Big shoes to follow, but uh, to step into, as for, you know, I, yeah. Pope, and his um, teachings are just, I mean, he fell volumes. If anyone could not fill his shoes but follow in his footsteps, it was Joseph Ratzinger. He had a tough, tough role to play, for sure. Yes. Very different personality. You know, Benedict, um, Joseph Ratzinger was very shy. Um, he was more of a scholar monk. 
He was more of an, ed- you know, an academic, or he loved to write and research. Um, John Paul was very effusive in his personality, very gregarious, and, and not shy by any means. You know, he was into drama and all kinds of other things. Uh, Benedict did not, you know, the one thing about Benedict, he didn't try to fill those shoes. He did, he did try to, he kept the continuity of the magisterium, but he was himself. He yes. acted him, he acted his own, as his own person, and um, yet continued the teachings of John Paul. Um, and tried to reinforce those teachings in his own way. He was he was wonderful as an erudite, recondite scholar. You know, his writings on um, Jesus of Nazareth, his encyclicals, um, his preaching. I, I was very blessed to be in his presence for some very wonderful homilies that he, he he delivered, and they were always very well put together, very, very well um, stated, and very deep reflections on the scriptures, the fathers, the history of the church. He would often even take in the architecture of a building and incorporate that into a homily. And you're looking around and you're saying, wow, that's amazing. You know, that he actually thought of a, of a detail of a building you're sitting in as he's giving the homily, he's pointing that out to you. You know, so he had his own gifts. You know, Benedict had his own, his own ability. And he was the right-hand man of John Paul, so he's a very trusted um, collaborator with John Paul II. Yeah, it was um, his. It was Benedict. both John Paul and and Ratzinger's writings that were hugely instrumental in our conversion to the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We used to call I him mean, the rat. Um, <laughs> the what? The rat. We, the rat, as in Reaper Cheap, the rat yeah, in yeah. our chronicles. So we always. Oh, uh, the chronicles, right, the right, rat. right. <laughs> he had a playful, you know, John Paul had a playful side and so did Benedict. Benedict had a very playful side. He could, you know, he loved, he had a beautiful smile. He had that wonderful uh, hair, you know, his beautiful, like Santa Claus almost. Um, he, he, you know, the playfulness, he loved cats. He loved to feed cats, stray cats in Rome. He would feed them. He was a <laughs> gentle man. You know, when he's a very gentle man, a very, he wasn't feel of, with machinations, he wasn't trying to get over people. He wasn't a politician. He was he was a gentleman and a scholar. Um, you know, he was he was he was kind. I remember meeting with, meeting him as a seminarian. I was cross. It was early. I was going to school in Rome, and I happened to cross St. Peter's Square, and there I bumped into Cardinal Ratzinger, and Cardinal Ratzinger was just carrying his briefcase and had a plain black cassock on, very unassuming. Hmm. I, of course, I knew who he was, but we met one on one. It was very interesting. It was it just fate. I just bumped, literally bumped into him, <laughs> and then um, years later, I was at a restaurant and one of his favorite restaurants in Rome, and we were sitting literally back to back, right at the same, in the same restaurant. And we, and so, um, and then I was able to be with him, at, you know, when he was pope several times, and uh, so, and John Paul many, many times before that. So, I was very, very blessed to be. Um, with both of those popes, and to to meet John Paul, to meet Benedict. So. Oh, wonderful! He was personal. The the gentleman I've worked with and um, been co-authored with, um, my philosophy professor Stephen Schwartz. His parents, Baldwin and Laney Schwartz, were personal friends of of Joseph Ratzinger's. And mm-hmm. uh, he, he always says they all had dinner together the night before he. He was being elected pope. He already knew it. Oh wow! Couldn't... The night before. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, they were close personal friends. It was very sweet. So. Oh, very nice. nice. Very nice. <laughs> yes, I was fortunate to be in Rome for the Jubilee, two thousand, um, under John Paul II. And then I was a young priest. I was only ordained at that time in three years, and um, I was doing my graduate work at that point. And. Uh, the city was so vibrant, the life of the church, he, he just, everything was cleaned up, and there was an excitement in the air, a real sense of, like, this was a real turning point of the pontificate of John Paul, the life of the church, you know, beginning a new millennium, and um, I just remember just feeling so much more connected to the, to the universality of the church, with its pilgrims coming from all over the world, and being able to pray together in the common language of the church, Latin, with a Pope who was ailing, but yet very much in tune to what was going on and very much insisting on, you know, getting to that, to that Jubilee. And then with Benedict, the crowds picked up even for his audiences. You could do a standing room only. 
back to back. I was there for many audiences with with him, and there was a real sense of warmth and enthusiasm and zeal, um, a real joy that continued on from John Paul and Benedict had his own way of communicating that joy too. He loved the word joy on Italian joy and he would communicate that joy in his own way. So and your book brings us all the way up to the present to Pope Francis who continues mm -hmm. to teach us as well. It's, it's really a beautiful um, time to be Catholic. It seems to me, I'm very grateful to be Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great yeah, gift. It's it's yes. challenge. It's challenging. It has its you know the world is against us. Our world is always against the gospel. You know the go. We can never expect right. to. if you're if the world starts applauding you for being Catholic, then you know you're not a good Catholic. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> once the world starts saying you know bravo, bravo, kudos, then there's a problem because the world you know the world does not is opposed to the church because the world is of of, of the evil one. He's the father of of lies and the, and he's the lord of this world so mm -hmm. but to be catholic it to be opposed to that you know to build up the kingdom of god on earth mm -hmm. i think i thought the hardest thing person you had to talk about was francis because we're so close yes. to him right now we're you know in the yes. midst of papacy i think it's always much easier to look back um and yes, put together so. what what we've been taught by a particular pope um, yes. But your your book does beautifully I, end with Francis. Um, yes, I, I I would I guess when after Francis's pontificate, I could you know more freely um, explain things and talk about his pontificate. But always like even with church history historians, you always stop like twenty years, a generation before you you have to give time to reflect and let things seep in and sink in before you can judge things properly. It's easy to judge. Um, what already has happened, and you know, each pope has died and, and moved on. As you said, with Francis, he's still here, he's still moving, he's still talking and teaching and doing other things, traveling. So, when the time comes, hopefully, if I'm still around, I'll you know reflect more on his pontificate. And, and, um, so, but well, the, I mean, the continuity is there, yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, the title again is A Concise History of a Hundred Years of Papal Teaching on Catholic education. Is there anything that was, I mean, there's so much in the book. It's, it's not a long book. It's, it's a very doable book. So I, I really recommend it um, for lay people, for teachers, um, for parents to really take a look at the importance of, of Catholic education. Um, is there anything uh, that you would, that we've missed as far as something that's really important that you'd like to say? about the book or um, I, I, think, I, I think the book is as you said it's reasonable it's only 87 pages it, I think it's a good read it's it flows it's logical it's chronological um these are highlights you know I'm not the actual text the the mission of the Catholic, of Catholic schools a century of reflection and direction that's more like a that's the the foundation of this this book here that's a anthology that's thousand pages that's more of a reference book for Catholic school teachers and administrators. This is a distillation of that. I distilled all that into this so that people could more readily read it, you know, pick this up rather than reading a thousand pages. You have a, you have a sampling of what the what these popes wrote, and you can then say, okay, well, this whets my appetite. I'll go back and read more. And I really wanted to give a human context, a historical context for each pope, so you're not just reading plain text. You're understanding who this Pope is, where he lived, what were the times in which he lived, what, what were the challenges that he faced. And, um, you know, the Church moves forward in history, and we're here for a brief time, but these men each made, uh, had an impact, made a contribution, and then they build on one another. That's the beauty of the succession of the Popes and the Bishops. They build on, they, they build on each other's magisterium. And um, so that's what, that's what I wanted to show. Well, I think you did a great job showing that, the continuity between them. Um, and this can be gotten through en route, I assume, and through Amazon? Yes, Am yes, right. Um, um, en route, uh, make um, books and media, um, Sebastian the Food, and um, it's, um, it's available on Amazon. I believe it's also Kindle. I don't have Kindle, so, but I believe it's also available 
no Kindle wonder. form. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. This has been delightful. I really enjoyed reading it. It gave me a wonderful perspective on 100 years, like you said, in 87 pages, which was, was quite exciting to read. I really enjoyed it. And like you said, it, it's, it's a great introduction. And then if you want to go deeper, you can dig deeper because you've, you know, right. you've the encyclicals to go to. Right. And read more in depth. Great. Would you like I to end up with the Father? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your You're welcome. coming Thank on you. for an interview. and. Uh, Hopefully our paths will cross again. Sounds good. Have a good one. God bless. Thank you. Take care. Bye.